three men and a multiverse of sci-fi's finest spacecraft. But which ones can claim to be the greatest ships ever? Welcome to Space Dock Jury. And welcome to Space Dock Jury Episode 7. I'm Lee, and I'm bringing the Reapers. I'm Peter, and I'm bringing Nemesis the, War- Nemesis the Warlock ship, the Blitzbeer. Mm. And I'm Andy, and I'm bringing the Shadow Battle Crab from Babylon 5. So, there you go. Reapers, Blitzbeers, Shadow Battle Crabs. It can only be Organic Spaceships Month. Way. Or Organic Spaceships Week. Or episode. Living ship. Ship. Let, let's go Living <laughs> Ships. Because yeah. Reapers being organic. <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's a bit, <laughs> bit, bit back and forth on that one. Yes, but, yes. you know, we'll worry about it another time. We'll so, get to that in a bit. We'll get to that in a bit. So, um, yes... It's going to be an interesting one this week because um, I think our rules are going to get tested to destruction with this kind of thing. Again. Mm, Again. (laughs) So, so before we get onto that, let's just recap what we had last time. And Andy, what is our top ten at the moment? Oh, thank you, Lee. Uh, The top ten as it currently stands, in a ten, Slave 1, Fets of with 43 points. At number nine, the Plucked Pelican, the White Star, with 50 In at 8, new, the Icarus 2 with 53. At 7, the old stalwart has been here since episode 1, the Omega-class destroyer, the Agamemnon, with 54 points. At 6, the SSV Normandy SR1 with 57. In at 5, the USS Dustbuster with 60. At 4, the Super Star Destroyer Executor with 62. At 3, the Battlestar Pegasus with 64. Holding steady at number 2, the Borg Cube with 67 points. And still sitting pretty at number one, the Vengeful Spirit from Warhammer 40,000 with 69. Hey, there you go. Whew. Well, there you go. So that's our, that's our top ten as it stands. Um, if you want to see where everyone else is, look on the Facebook group because we've got 23 ships on the board at the minute and we ain't reading them out every week. <laughs> but we're, you know, we might, yeah, we might just put a link up to, the, um, to a protected version of the of the document yes but, to stop uh, people editing things and uh yeah. correcting what they perceive as slights yes indeed. i don't care how much you complain uh elton button moonship ain't getting any more than what it is <laughs> no no way it's lucky to be there at all yeah yes. that's the sound that's the sound of a man who just wished he didn't have easter <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so there you go so we have shadow battle crab we have the reapers and we have this blitz spear seth from Nemesis the Warlock. So, before we get going, um, who's going next? Who's going to uh, I'll be going first? up first. Okie dokie. So, Andy, over to you, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, this week I have brought uh, a Shadow Battle Crab from Babylon 5. Mm. Easily distinguished by its spiny, almost spider-like shape and its consistently undulating black skin, the shadow vessels are known to have a deeply unsettling effect on sentience and can somehow project a scream-like noise into the minds of any that get near it as it goes by. Even an active, a shadow vessel is extremely dangerous. If you were to touch it, it would be as if the life itself was sucked right out of you and telepaths who try scanning it are driven insane. I've had dates like that. Yeah, yeah haven't we all? <laughs> Extremely powerful war machine, its primary beam weapon has the energy output on par with a controlled thermonuclear reaction, and it can effortlessly cut through even four mile wild space stations from a range of a dozen miles. A direct hit from this weapon under normal circumstances um, uh, under normal circumstances is sufficient to destroy almost any known ship, and a fully operational shadow vessel never misses. Shadow vessels also possess a weapon capable of destabilizing jump points. When fired into an active hyperspace vortex, it causes the formed jump point to quickly collapse, which leads to a massive shockwave that will destroy any ships caught in a blast radius. 
Mm. Like most shadow technology, these ships require a living component to operate. This takes the form of a specially prepared sentient being uh, of a once merged acts as the ship's central processing unit. The only known weakness in, in the system is the susceptibility of telepathic interference. A sufficiently strong telepath can in effect jam a ship's systems, leaving it vulnerable to attack with conventional energy weapons. Uh, a little bit of behind the scenes uh, information. It was created by Ron Thornton at Foundation Imaging, and it was only possible due to CGI to get the moving skin effect. And this was created by a procedural uh, texture, which was the same one used on the Drazi Sunhawks. Uh, when coming up with a contest, JMS didn't really have a clue what he wanted. He just said, make it scary. Um, so uh, Ron decided he wanted to break the mould a little bit and make uh, the battle crab something familiar that will give you the willies when you saw one, even if you've never seen it before. There's like um, ingrained psychological terrors like black widow spiders and stuff like that. Um, Ron, Mojo and John Tesca uh, discussed how a weapon effect might appear to be effortless. His clue was the Daleks. They just pull a plunger and said exterminate and they wanted the same sort of effect. They just wanted um, a cutting beam which will eloquently demonstrate how powerful and nonchalantly these ships could slice up an entire fleet without upsetting the manicurist who was trimming their nails. Hmm. So there you have the Shadow Battle Fair. Right. Scream if you love it. Yeah, scream if you want to go faster. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it, I've got to say on a personal note, it, this was when these things first appeared in Babylon 5. Uh, it was season two, wasn't it? With... Um, mm. Yep. No, season uh, well, one. Nan- well, you, you get a glimpse in season one. You get a glimpse, but you've got two. them properly in season two, especially yeah. when the Nan ship went to Zahadum. Yeah. And you just see them kind of phase in, and they just sliced that ship in half like yeah. it wasn't anything. And then again, um, is it Messages from Earth? Where was that one that's buried on Mars? Yeah. And yeah that's the the, the one music one. then, when that thing goes insane, and it kind of escapes. Oh, that's just... The, these ships, even today, give me a little bit of the heebie-jeebies. It's just... Uh, <laughs> So, uh, but yes, fun times, fun times. But yes, well, we're not here to gush over it. We're here to rate this motherfucker. So let's get it on, shall we? Yes. So, size. Now, uh, these actually ships come in variable amount of size, which I think (laughs) is down to the organic. They are, in effect, grown to different sizes. But typically, the main ones we see in the show are between one and two kilometers in length. Mm -hmm. Or it would give us a ten. Ooh. Ooh, okay, hold on, hold on, I forgot my calculator. Ah, oh, it's all gone wrong. Ah. <laughs> no, but now it'll be a brief intermission. <laughs> no, it's all right, I'm getting my calculator up. Go on, carry on, so it's ten. Sort of. Okay, ten. Now, now sublight speed. Uh, not entirely sure where we're going to rate this one. Um, they are very fast from what we can see. They're very manoeuvrable. I mean, I don't think they're quite as manoeuvrable as White Stars, but we'll come to that in a minute. minute. But there's not much which can outrun them, um, as I recall. So I think, for a change, I've not brought a flying brick to the equation. No, uh, it's, it's unusual. So I, I think we're in the kind of uh, crossing the solar system hours, maybe? That was what I was thinking. It's funny yeah. enough, that's what I was thinking too. So, so I think right, we're all agreed on that. It's a four. FTL, we're talking uh, jump gates, uh, Babylon 5 technology. So that's I'm going three. for my free there. Lovely. Good arguments mm-hmm. there. Now, maneuverability. Again, I don't think they're quite as maneuverable as the White Star. But I, I think we're definitely talking a four at least. These things will turn on a dime. They do swivel around quite a bit. They yes. swivel around very... It, it's very much a case of if you're sneaking up behind them, they sw- swing around very quickly and come towards you and rape your face. So, um, <laughs> nice. I think we're going for a four there. <laughs> I think we are. Yes, a four. Yes. Now, firepower. Now, uh, these are easily one-shotting a capital ships, but this whole collapsing jump gate weapon... Mm. What, what are we talking here? Because uh, any ships caught in the blast radius of that are going down as well. So... I think other, other ships in, in Babylon 5 could destroy junk gates, though, to be fair. Yeah. Well, the... it's not, I'm not saying it's a unique thing or not. I'm just saying mm. it is uh, a, an ability it has. Its primary weapon alone will slice up pretty much any ship in Babylon 5 bar the, the first level, the, quest, the first ones. The level. question is, was that weapon designed to destroy a jump gate or was it just something that we saw happen in that particular episode? I think it was designed to destroy jump gates, and I think well, that's part... I don't think it takes much to destroy jump gates, though, because wasn't there no, no, once the was... ship that was going to crash into one, and that was going to destroy it as well? Mm. It's not just the gates themselves; it's the vortexes. So, if you have your Omega class destroyer about to jump out, it can collapse that jump gate. 
I, I think that's what yeah. you're just saying. I mean, so I... it's not saying it's not saying it's destroying the arms which generate the jump gate, like the one parked outside Babylon Five. It's saying it has something that will disrupt the actual vortexes that jump capable ships can generate. Hmm. It's kind of difficult. I mean, I, w- I would err on an eleven if that's what you're after. I think about. I, I think that's fair because again, I don't know too much about this, and I, I, again, I haven't been able to watch all of Babylon Five. I did start, and I thought I kind of need to rewatch Babylon Five at some point. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, f- I think eleven ish because again, it can one shot capital ships with its slicey beam as it is. It's definitely it's, at least ten. You don't get. Mm. Any I, I, I think eleven because it, it, it can. If you're trying to run away, it's collapsing your jump gate and it's blowing you up and anyone who's near you. But the, um, but my point is, it you only ever see it do that once, and to me that sound that smacks of that would be a cool way of just stopping them from getting away in story terms. You know what I mean? It, I know in, I know what you mean. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll take the ten if you if you think that's a fairer. Score. I, I mean, I think eleven because it's got it's over the capital ships because it can do extra. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not a problem with 11, un- unless Pete's got some problem. I could, I could go, no, I mean, it's, it's round up, because we haven't been particularly specific, have we, beyond no. uh, one, beyond 10, then no, there's a big gap. It's, it's, 10, is, 10 is one shot, and there's a bit of a gap, and then yeah. at 14 yeah. we have blow up a planet. So <laughs> let's, let's, estab- let's establish this as 11 then, shall okay. we? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. I, I think that's good. And, and I think that actually tallies nicely with where we've put other Babylon 5 ships in the past, because... Mm. This is a nasty piece of work which will mess you up. So, now for defence. Um, active defence, uh, I don't really think it has anything as such, does it? It generally no. is just... It's, it, it doesn't have any sort of point mm. defence. It doesn't have any sort of... Um, it's, it's literally just its manoeuvrability. It's just its manoeuvrability. Um, so I think just a one for active. Yep. Uh, now for passive, um, it has... It was heavily armored. It also, it's it's regenerating abilities in, in the same way the White Star had that sense of you know yeah, it's well, uh, that living comes, skin. I guess that comes under special, really. Yeah, is that coming yeah, under yeah. special? Or in that it case, does, I yeah. think we could probably only really claim heavy armor then for um, yeah passive because again we see the amount of abuse this thing can take. Um, yeah, you, you, you need like lot. three or four White Stars basically pummeling it. With that in mind, can I ask for free? And I ask for free because although it's heavy armor, it's it's heavily enough armored that, like you said, you can have three white stars, which are admittedly very powerful ships, with continuous fire, uh, continuous fire before it will crumple it. It might not have shields in the sense of Star Trek has shields, but I still think we have to acknowledge that it takes an awful lot to get through its skin. Hmm. See, because the thing is, that's that's the by the very definition what heavy armor is. I I think though, when we've said heavy armor in the past, we've been like it takes a few, it, it, you know, explosions happen next to the ship. You know, it, it takes some hits, but you know, it's like an explosion. It's done. This again, you you think of those episodes where you have three or four white stars, and, and all the other ones firing continuously on it hmm. before it all kind of collapse plus it's with the um the only way they were able to do that in effect was the um the telepath locking it yeah so so what so what are we saying here pete what do you reckon yeah i mean i can see where where andy's getting at because mm. yes it's it, it they do take a lot of a pounding so i'm, I'm quite happy with giving it a three okay. um, it kind of reflects what we see on screen i think yeah fair enough okay so then we're on to special now on for special, uh, we have the regenerative abilities of mm-hmm. it. So uh, they can cloak. That's two. Uh, yeah. And um, I think we have to do something. There's, I think there's a psychological aspect here we need to acknowledge. That scream in the mind, that sense of when you when, when you see one, you can go be driven insane. I think that in of itself <laughs> qualifies it for an extra point for special there. I'm happy with that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So That's three for um, three for three special. for special. Wow, it's the most special ship out of the lot. <laughs> it, it is very special. <laughs> okay. Um, crew size. Okay. Crew size it has one. a crew of one. <laughs> so, yeah. So it occasionally are... will take a passenger unwilling in his star fury. Um, so where do you think that comes? I mean, because we've got a score up to a uh, twenty thousand. So what do you reckon? It, it's one. <laughs> it's going one. <laughs> okay. Um, a more interesting question is competence, because mm. mm. the crew—they're actually 
they're, they're a component of the ship. They're not... The crew aren't actually operating the ship, if you take my meaning. They are merely a component within it. Um, well, we need we kind of need to acknowledge this because and ahead of time because the Reaper is going to come into the sort of very similar arena. The, 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 the Reaper is going to make a mess of this, but let, let, yeah. let's at least try and head this one off here. Um, now, I mean, we've got to say that the shadows, they, they are... We, we see them both being animalistic with uh, the one which was uh, awoken on Mars where it was kind of insane. Mm. But we also see them being very cunning, able to lay traps um, uh, and working to a higher power. I, I always viewed that the Shadow Battle Crabs were, to, to borrow from the Star Trek vernaculum, along the lines of Borg drones. They are individually, if they're cut off from the, quote, collective, end quote, pretty stupid. But when operating as part of the Shadow's master plan, if you will, less so. But I, I really don't know where we'd... I mean, I, I don't think you ever see them doing stupid stuff in battle. If there's a shadow ship in the area, it's going to mess up your day and it's not going to make a mistake. We, we've got that very clearly stated. Yeah. They never miss if it's fully operational. But they do. We have no, no, seen, it's, it's, we've seen, it's, we've seen them We've seen them do that. It says if it's fully operational, they never miss. So if it misses, it wasn't fully operational. Oh, what a catch-all. <laughs> hey, hey, this, is, this, is, this is from uh, the great bird of the galaxy himself, JMS. This is, this is his words. If it's fully operational, they never miss. Yes. And, again, with, with, um, again, the only reason that the um, younger races were really able to do them was when they figured out the telepaths can fuck with them and started sticking telepaths on their ships. Mm. So, so, there, so the competence isn't... So really, their competence isn't particularly high. I don't think it's high, but at the same time, I, I, I can't really in good conscience stick them down in the Red Dwarf. I, I, I'm well, probably going for yeah. about a three, and that is based purely on the fact of I, I don't know where else to put them. They are both <laughs> extremely competent and extremely stupid in the course of a show. Yes. <laughs> so I'm kind of hedged my bets here. Yeah. I think that's fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think that's fair enough, actually. Three, three was probably where I, wouldn't, I would have drawn the line. I think is probably the point. Oh, I, I, I can't in a in good conscience say they're on the level of, say, you know, Sheridan or Agamemnon, you know, or, you know, an elite Starfleet team or whatever, you know. They're not that, but at the same time, they're not mm. incompetent. <laughs> they're not down there with the, um, you know, yeah. it's a sickness. <laughs> no, no, they're not down with a sickness. No. <laughs> okay. Mm. Uh, realisation. Uh, now, for exterior realisation, I know, I know this is an older CGI model, Mm-hmm. Um, but I still want to ask for five, and that's because... Whoa! Hey, let, no me... Way. All right, let me finish. <laughs> it's, it's, to my mind, one of the better realised organic ships on Babylon 5. It, <laughs> it, it invokes... I mean, that's a silhouette, but you see that. That tells you that that is a nasty horror thing. And again, it was the first time we got a sense of a moving, living skin on a ship. It was that sense of something really kind of evil and just kind of the and and nasa themselves have even uh, acknowledged this by sneaking it into um some artwork when they uh were released in some concept art from epsilon rindai when they were doing some artwork from that but yeah I, I i think exterior realization i still think this stands up really well today well before i stamp on it <laughs> <laughs> okay. what i would say is a very nice effect when when they're being attacked from all sides and they do finally go bl- kablooey they that way that they kind of curl up yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's like you know you've exposed it it's like you've got a, a magnifying glass on an ant or something it's, <laughs> it's yeah exactly you've, you've fried all its muscles and it's contracting i do like that so i'll give yeah. it some points for that but ultimately this suffers from the, the same problem that your um agamemnon suffers from is that the effects in in babylon 5 really don't stand up very well to modern eyes oh, I, I, I think you've got to, i think you've got to walk you've got to look past what was that you've got to look at the design of the model how well that stands up and well i do well, think you do need to penalize stuff that doesn't stand up so well today ultimately i still think and it stands this goes very well today. back to thunderbird 3 again because thunderbird 3 does stand up well still today uh, the babylon 5 effects don't for the most part I, I'm not talking about the effects so much. I'm talking about the realisation of the ship, how well the ship was conceived, the model, and, and 
Yeah, but that, com- that it- comes into realisation, doesn't it? The way it's presented on screen or in the it's page. It's presented on screen, but the, the ship itself is... It, it, throughout the course of a season, it gets better as it goes on. You know, the effects... I won't say the effects in season five were better than season one, but it was a sense of, you know, as they're learning the technology, it gets better. The ship... I posted a picture on the Facebook group not two weeks ago uh, of the Agamemnon, of the actual model. And, and if it's lit properly, as you can do today... The model itself. But it's, that's not how you see it it's on screen. Exactly. You can't say how, how you do today. That's not how you, you, you see uh, Babylon 5, is it? That's not how somebody comes to Babylon 5 generally. They come to it by sticking the, either catching it on telly or sticking the DVD in. And it don't look that great. I think it still looks great. I, I still think that ship stands up fantastically well. And even, I, I think of all the ships in Babylon 5, the shadows were probably the most iconic, best realised ones of them all. Well, that's the prosecution. That's okay, the defence, okay. Mr. Lee. Okay. Well, what? You decide. Okay. So, so Andy's going for a five. What would you have said, Pete? I would if, have said a three. A three. See, now, at the risk of sounding like I'm sitting on the fence, I would have, I would have pitched a four. And the reason, it's a safe bet, isn't it? <laughs> no, 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 no. The reason I would have pitched a four was because it's the same reason I pitched for the for a four for um for the um White Star, which is modeling side of things can't go wrong i think it's really well done what lets the the shadows down especially and it, there's a shot and i'm desperately trying to find it on google right now but there's a shot where the, where it's carried away a certain member of the command staff mr garibaldi mr. i know the oh, shot yeah oh, oh yeah and basically you get to see what is essentially the vein procedural texture from lightwave 5 basically swirling around on its body with a terrible, terrible bass relief you know, em- emboss on it. And that's fine. It's, it looks fantastic when the ship's about an inch across on your, sh- on your screen. Mm-hmm. But when you get to full screen, when it's as big as your screen, you become very, very, it becomes very, very apparent that it's actually very, very clearly CGI. Mm. And so I... That's where I. That's where I kind of have to do the sort of. Well, I've seen CGI spaceships, and done well. You know, you look at your Galacticas, you look at your Pegasus, you look at all that stuff. Yeah. You look at, you know, sort of early, mid. You know, you you look at some of you know some of the some of the earlier stuff like Gun Stars and stuff like that, and you think great. And you look at a shadow ship, and you think it looks. As far as a shape is concerned, you have got no arguments from me. If it was just based on the model alone, I'd go, "Yep, definitely five bang there," because it looks menacing. It does the job. It looks fantastic, but the texture on it and the 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 fact that it doesn't stand up to much scrutiny if it gets bigger than say like the size of your hand on a twenty-seven inch screen, it you know just just kind of takes the edge off it. It just makes it look very very clearly cgi and oh, for the... fine. i'll take i'll take the four i mean uh that that good point well made uh, uh, that's, it, it, it certainly was a case of with the shadows one of its uh, it was definitely a case where less was always more with those yeah and, you... and and they by, by and large throughout the entire series they didn't fall into the borg trap that voyager did even when you had say towards the end with um uh the death cloud and everything like this Oh, the death cloud. You, <laughs> the death cloud. But I'm, I'm saying you never got a sense of where they were making them ship of a week where you could just destroy them like that because no, whatever no, reason. No. So, yeah, like I said, I'll take the four. I'm happy with that. Mm. Um, interior, zero, because we don't see any interior ever. No. Well, you see through it at one point. That's, that's part of the exterior problem. <laughs> you, you, you see through it about that point. But yeah, uh, I, I just have to take a zero for interior. Mm. Um, yeah. Science now for science. Oh. <laughs> yes, living ships yeah. may be interesting. On science. Living ships. Um, I, 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 I'm just gonna have to go for the one. It's a way of the fairies. Yeah, I can't even argue that. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah, I don't think I don't think you got any compl- I don't think you got any, any leg to stand on where that's concerned. I'm afraid. <laughs> no, you, you watch out, Mister Giant Cuttlefish. Don't worry, I, I've, I've already, I've already made my piece with precisely where it's going on the exterior, interior, and science. <laughs> but so, cool facts. <laughs> yes, cool. Um, so, your four points. Where are you going to put? Oh, this? mate, I'm giving it all of my four points, mate. This thing's fucking awesome. Cool. E- even today, it, it's it's not just how the ship looks; it's that scream. Yeah. Every mm-hmm. time you heard that scream, and that thing kind of phased in, and 
the speed it was going at, and it was just like that was a shit which just screamed menace. Yep. <laughs> Okie dokie. Um, so, what about you, Pete? I yep. Uh, it's good. It's it's not perfect, but it's definitely good and and very effective. The scream and stuff. So yeah, I'll go for a two. Okay, a two. So that puts that at six. I would. I have to say, I was a Babylon Five absolute nut job at one point and to the point where i used to make a fanzine about it so i i can't i can't look at this without rose tinted specs being welded firmly on my head and i i've got to give it a three so that makes that nine by my measure nine points yeah nine points yep. cool so there you go so the first one of the episode uh, the shadow battle crab and it's sitting on 57 points mm-hmm. scored more than the Agamemnon, which is appropriate because I think it could easily best the Agamemnon in a fight. Yep. Definitely, definitely. So there you go. Interesting. So, whew, well, there you go. So the Shadow Battle Crab, 57 points, putting it in at number seven on our chart as it currently stands. So, um, who would like... So, Pete, would you like to go next or do you want me to go next? I... Uh, I'm quite happy to go next, if you want, yeah. Okay, well then, uh, away you go, sir. Okay, switch the damn iPad back on, because it switched itself off. <laughs> cool, the Blitz Spear. Mm. Now this is the Warlock ship. It's uh, our first comic book ship, so we're testing the waters here again. Yep. Uh, debuted in 2000 AD, Prog 167, back in the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, written by Pat Mills and illustrated by Kevin O'Neill of his spiky style it's the ship owned by freedom fighter stroke anarchist nemesis the warlock uh, uh, appeared before he did in fact rather curiously yeah. the alien doesn't appear outside his ship in the first strip that doesn't matter because basically it's his head <laughs> for the most part <laughs> the, 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 the front of the ship is nemesis's head yes <laughs> Uh, originally, it was just meant as a one-off story uh, about this strange world of the termite tube system of transport, which is, you know, this crazy below-ground system of transport that makes London Underground look positively pedestrian. Actually, London Underground makes London Underground look positive pedestrian, but never mind. <laughs> Inspired by a metal hurlance, uh, it's got wonderful visuals. I must admit, it's never been my favourite strip because the stories have always been very weird and uh, very heavy on satire as well revealing the hypocrisies of bigotry uh, but there's not much in the way of space battles it has to be said so uh, therefore I was I was intrigued by the alien visuals but the, the storytelling wasn't quite to my taste Blitz Spear itself is fashioned in the image of its owner uh, the front end is basically a copy of his head there's some sort of organicness in the mid section before hitting the drive section which is rather more standard spaceship fare and mm. um, not particularly well realised it has to be said <laughs> Uh, from 1980, the 1983-2000 AD annual, we learn a lot about the Blitzbeer because it's basically there's a one strip that features it. And we learn originally it was a space squid called Seth. And that would normally... Wait, wait, scam- wait, 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 wait. Seth? Yeah, I'm- yes. Seth. Seth. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, just just to bring you up to speed, that there was a lot of um, religious imagery and religious ga- um, naming. So mm-hmm. there was um, Nemesis' son was Thoth. For example, okay, mm, yeah. we're, we're going a Stargate route here. Gotcha. Oh, very much so. Bef- well before Stargate. Yep. Uh, it, the fact that it was originally didn't need a pilot would normally discount the ship, but in its natural state, Seth couldn't travel much beyond its home planet. So, Nemesis had to tame his steed, and case it in living metal, using magic. Guess how this is going to score in science <laughs> to enable it to travel beyond the stars. So it's it's not your natural space squid. This is a space squid that's been taken and shaped and forged in order to be used as a spaceship. Mm-hmm. That's right. So, in terms of scoring, yes, this is going to be an size interesting one. would normally be the easy bit, but yes. I couldn't find any facts online. Uh, and to be honest, sort of relative size was never a particular issue for Mills. Uh, mm. Some variation depending on who's doing the art, basically. But uh, best guess, Mister Spock, around about ten meters. So we've got one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Give it a give it a one. 
Um, okay, so trust me, it's going to need all the points it can get, this one. Yes, definitely. <laughs> On the sublight speed, we're told in the strip that it would travel at speeds that would kill most men. Mm. So that that's fast. But oh. beyond that, <laughs> how fast is that? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it it's kind of... In in the comics, this thing kind of outruns everything mm. in terms. So it's more you would have to treat it very much like an X wing fighter. That's kind of the way it was kind of portrayed in the panels mm-hmm. that it would go from like a standing start to fucking hell. Really, and the very... whole idea is it's going around this tube system like a crazy thing. Yeah, basically. So... Yeah, which we're going to get into in a minute. That's going to be fun. <laughs> um, for, for the for those of you who don't know, um, and for Andy, obviously, if you've never read it, but the 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 whole point is that the termite empire, the human termite empire, exists in hyperspace tubes that are literally like solid jump gates, mm-hmm. um, like a sewer system throughout the subspace of the universe. Right. Um, but the but you still have to drive down these things. So you have to maintain a speed of light or thereabouts. So, so I think we're looking at five, aren't we? So I well, think that we depends. Are. Are, you, are you saying its sublight is five and its FTL is uh, one? Or well, no, are you well, saying its sublight is less than that, but it's capable of faster FTL travel? No, I'm, th- I'm saying if, I mean, not to speak for Pete, but just because I'm the only other person on the cast yeah, yeah. Of it. I would say I would say it's the speed it travels when it's out of the hyperspace tubes mm-hmm. is literally system to system light speed. Right. So that's five. So that's a five. Mm-hmm. Right. But And it doesn't just travel in the tubes. It does no. travel interplanetary. Yeah. Uh, we are told it does have faster than light capability, but it, it doesn't tell give us any more details than that. So I was gonna Aim for a two for faster than light, which well, is well. I was going to gonna... say if we don't have any information on FTLs, though, we usually default to one, assuming it can FTL. We just it can F- have... It definitely can FTL. It's just we, we're given no more. You're right. We're given no more information than that. So it the only thing, one, the only right. thing I would say is yep. the 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 termite hyperspace boom tubes, which is what they're actually called, yep. are actually the equivalent of a jump gate. And even though they exist as solid objects that you travel down in multiple dimensions, you still need to open a gateway into them. Mm. So effectively, he is doing effect. Seth is essentially opening a jump gate into a boom tube, and in you go. Well, I, 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 I got no leg to stand on here. I got no frame of reference, Danny. No, so, I mean, um... I mean, I mean. Okay, let's <laughs> let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. If 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 a jump gate existed and it was a tube, like a solid toilet tube, yeah. Yeah. So that already exists, and then you had to open a door into that. Does that count as the ship actually travelling jump gate, or is if it... a ship itself has, if if a ship itself can outside of that tube independently open an access point, mm. yes. But if it's actually just asking the tube permission to come in, and the tube is opening it, it basically depends where the engines are. If mm. it's jump engines, as it were, are on the ship, it counts. If they're not on the ship, if they're solely dependent on this tube, they don't count. Right. Well, I guess it's a one then. Or... It's a one. I, I think that's what I yeah. kind of boiled it no, down to as well in the end. That's yeah. fair yeah. enough. I just wanted to get it clear because it is kind of a really weird halfway house. Yeah. Mm. And, and again, part of our problem is that Pat Mills really isn't interested in this sort of gubbins. He's interested in the, the satirical what? nature of his strip. <laughs> I know, I know. This this is why it's not my favourite 2018 strip, but it is a cool looking ship. So I wouldn't yeah. defend it on that basis. But yeah. yes, in terms of actual facts and cool, you know, the, mm. the stats, you don't get much, I'm afraid. No. Maneuverability. It, it's hairs down these tubes at a rate of knots it can out, outfox it, any other craft uh, mm. that it comes across it stop on a around. dime from light speed yeah yep. so i'm going for a five for that one i'd give you a five well hey. i mean it is, it is effectively Double. a super maneuverable <laughs> fighter yeah if by all by all other measures mm-hmm. so yeah not a problem there i have no problem giving you a five for that cool then we move on to firepower, which isn't quite so impressive. Um, <laughs> it has it has some sort of laser that fires from the front and deals some limited damage, but not a great deal, it has to be said. So it's kind of, you're looking at your sort of, your fighter level 
firepower, which I think we said mm. was two, wasn't it? Two, two-ish. Yeah. 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 That, that was but it also, thrown into that, unless you want to put this under special, uh, is uh, it, it, it carves through other ships because it's got a pointy prow in the shape of Nemesis's head. Are, are you saying... Today is a good day today. Ramming speed! Exactly what I'm saying, and rather more effective than the Defiant ever was going to be at ramming as I, well, because this I, is I pointy. Would that special if I were you. Yeah, I, I, I would. Think, yeah, yeah, okay, that's cool. We'll, tra- we'll go for two for that, and I'll add one onto the special. Splendid. Well, special, you get a lot more than that, but we'll get to that in a sec. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. Yep. Superb. Mm. Okay, uh, defense, defense, defense. Uh, there's no ma- mention of any active defense. But no. it does get one for the manoeuvrability being high. Mm-hmm. Passive. Yeah. Uh, it, in one of the earlier strips, it shot down fairly easily. So we're we're looking at one at best, I think, for that one. Low yeah. armor. Yeah, I go along with that. Mm-hmm. Mm. And then we're on to special. So uh, we've we've got the the pointy prow of pointiness. Yes. And we've also got the fact that it regenerates. Cool. So that's yeah. at least two. Yeah. Lee, were you going to throw more points at me? Yeah. Please throw more points at me, I'll, Lee. I'll throw you one more point because what it also does is it also has the same ability that Nemesis does, which you can spit acid. It's actually got a defensive, like a like a sort of underneath. If you look underneath the ship, if, you, if you've got pictures of it, Andy, yeah, it looks like at the back of the face, just mm-hmm. underneath, there's a thing that kind of goes down, like, looks like teeth, looks like a grin. Yeah. And, yes. And essentially... That is its mouth. Okay. And much like Nemesis has the very same sort of deal, and they can basically gob acid. Power puke. Exactly. <laughs> but it's but it's it's but it's a thing that comes with the animal rather than the ship. So it's a case of it's it's got a very short range. But it's mm. like a like a like a low cl- low class flamethrower for all intents and purposes. Okay. Well. So Quite happy to have, give you that one as well. So yeah. that's three, is it? Yeah. Special. So that's yep. three for special. Splendid. Then moving on to crew, it only needs one crew person, so that's one. It can hold two, though. It can It can hold more. They hold, all the ABC warriors fit on it at one point. Oh, I, but oh, God, they're yes. not. They're not. They're not crew. That's the point, though. No. They're just passengers, and we already established that. Yep. You go with who, who actually needs to operate the ship, and you literally only need Nemesis to steer the bugger. So, mm-hmm. But on the upside, Nemesis is, and this is one of the weaknesses of the strip, really. Literally, he has no weaknesses. He's, he's the, this perfect character that can do what their uh, hell Pat Mills wants him to do. Yes. And always survives the day without a scratch. So I guess we're going to go a five for that. Yeah, I was going to yep. say, he, he even one point he dies and manages to get resurrected, so he is absolutely indestructible. <laughs> he gets stabbed yeah. through the heart with a big big spear. Several times, I seem to remember, yes. Mm-hmm. It's it's really... Yeah, why am I reading this again, Mr. Invulnerable? But anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, then we're on to realisation, which is an interesting one with comic books, obviously. Mm. Uh, it does to partly depend on who's doing the art. Mm-hmm. Um, Basically, on the Pat Mills, um, sorry, on the Kevin, Kevin O'Neill. O'Neill. Sorry, yeah, that's what I was thinking. And uh, Kevin O'Neill, it's very distinctive. Um, the, the, the clever way in which the exterior matches uh, the warlock's face. Um, the, the, I love the one from the annual. That's really cool because you get to see the whole species and their mm. development in space, which is quite cool. Mm. So I was angling for a three for this one, but I, you know, I'm happy to be uh, argued either way. Well, um, let's have Andy, because obviously he's never seen this thing before, and this is going to be a sort of reverse of his... Um, litmus test, let's see what this he is makes going to be a litmus yeah. test, and also sort of a version of the dr- eventual spirit, where he kind of came at it, where I came at it from complete knowing nothing. Yeah, it's, I mean, obviously it's slightly different, because although I've never read the book, I've got pictures here. Um, mm-hmm. in, in fact, do you want to just fire me across a couple of the ones which you're holding up as good examples? Because I, I don't know... Which ones in here are Kevin O'Neill from whoever? Okay, hold on. Um, here we go. Here comes one. Uh, that one. Uh-huh. Um, let's go for another one. Uh, basically, anything that's like proper noir and lots of shiny Yeah, surfaces. okay. I, I know the sort of ones you're getting at. And I've got some images open up here. Um, so my two thoughts when I first mm. look at this is... It looks, and again, I'm just going off of pictures off of Google. Yeah. So, you know, Sent you I've got one. no context there. My first thought is it looks like something out of Wipeout. 
the um, the racing game. Oh yeah, so I can see where you're coming from. Uh, right? yeah. So very, very much like that. Very Designers um, Republic. Obviously, obviously predating it, but yeah. yeah. Oh, obviously predating it, but again, I, I, this is my frame of reference since Wipeout. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, and the other thing, looking at these pictures, is it almost looks like uh, a ship that's towing something else. It's like you have a very sleek front section. Yeah, the back that's end is bolted on to something else. I mean, I, there's a couple of models here, and I, I know they're fan made models, but you know, again, it's gives you a kind of a three-dimensional feel to it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm assuming there's been no colour scheme that's, like, definitive on this. It's no, whatever. It, it's mm. all in black and white. So. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. a close... lot of people have gone with a yellow and black scheme here, which to me just looks like a JCB. No. No. <laughs> no the, okay. the, 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 general, the general consensus was it was a similar sort of colour to Nemesis, which is kind of like a dark green... green. Yeah. A, a sort of very sort of very dark sort of olive color and and the stripes were and was the, shi- the the stripes the white stripes are kind of very garish luminous color like a sort of insect so yeah. um I've, I've seen a few images where it's done as red um, okay but you know I mean, one, one of the aspects in which it ought to score at least something is the fact that its profile is immediately recognizable even if it's in shadow just because it's nemesis's bloody head <laughs> yeah so it's easily recognizable ship if i mean yeah. I'm, I'm i'm gonna let lee lead on this somewhat i mean my, my, my thoughts on it just start and again just based off of the images i'm having a quick look at here is it doesn't jump out of me as, as and it, and even those shots you sent across as the best examples. Mm. It it suffers somewhat from we'll, we'll call it nineteen eighties comic book syndrome, yes. where there's not really a consistency to it. I mean, it, it's it's recognisable as the same ship in both, but they're just interested in just getting it down on the picture and moving on to the next mm. stuff. And and we did mention this briefly with a vengeful spirit. You know, your mileage does vary depending on who's drawing it. Absolutely. And, and and I got to say, a couple of the shots I'm looking at here look a lot worse than yeah. other shots of it. There, sort of thing. Well, the so one, the one that, I... that's that's not the Blitz spear. That's um, his is his, his father's yeah, ship. Yeah, his father's ship. The one I just sent yeah. now. Yeah. But the thing is, it's uh, it's a shame it's so small. Okay. But the problem is with that one is that's that's a that's a Blitz spear without its armor. Mm-hmm. And basically, if it's left alone to its own devices, it gets even more spiky and it, it looks like it goes a bit feral. Yeah. Something out of the Hannibal TV series, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If they're, if they yeah, they're left to their natural state. That's how they end up. Uh, I, I mean, if it was down to me, based solely on the pictures, mm. I'd probably be saying a two. But that's like I said, I have no frame of reference here, so I'm going to defer to Mr. Medcalf, and mm. I will go with uh, okay. the consensus with him. No, I mean that's fair enough. I mean, I think your 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 vote will count with the cool factor. I think it will. It'll mm. do what will happen with the Gloriana, to be honest. But yeah. um, what about you, Pete? So what were you going for? I was going for a three. I think that's fair. I think that's fair simply because it does change from from artist to artist. Yeah, there's the red version that I was talking yeah, about Yeah, that, that's the one that was actually coloured by uh, Kevin O'Neill. So yeah. technically that's the, the actual colour scheme. Technically that's the colour, yeah. I suspect that looking at that image, that's just a case of to make it stand out from everything else. Yeah, <laughs> yes. that's also well, possibly, maybe... The, yes. Yeah, I mean, this is 2000 Plus, as we know, red ones go faster. Yeah, it seems yeah. Like. <laughs> yes. I think I think three's fair because, as Andy rightly points out, consistency is part of the problem. Is You, you don't get a consistent look to the ship from one artist to the next whereas yeah. with nemesis for example you do um so sometimes that ship's longer shorter slightly wider sometimes it goes a bit batshit crazy and, on the and horns. To be honest, most mostly only appears in the strips drawn by kevin o'neill and kevin o'neill doesn't give it a particular sort of consistency either no, I mean, no yeah again it's it's not really on their radar or something they're interested with no uh we'll get onto this particularly with the interior as well hmm. So it, yeah. it was actually, I was going to say very briefly, uh, just looking online, there's someone's done a fan sculpt mm. of what it looks like without its armour, which I just throw over into the old yeah, um, I've seen thing. It, it's got a very Geiger feel to it there, which yeah. uh, if that was like canon, I could probably go for. It, if if it was in that kind of HR Geiger that, style. That's its natural state. That's yeah. before yeah. they then meld the metal yeah. onto it to yeah. make it to travel between the stars so you can't yeah. really count that as the no I know, I know we can't count and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying this should influence at all but what i'm saying is if that if those sort of proportions were consistent throughout mm. and if that was kind of like what it was if you had something like that i'd be more inclined to go over three or four myself because i think that's 
yeah. cooler. But well, that's just we... again. Yeah. yeah. Shall we go with a three for that then? I, I think yep. three because I tell you what, I'm, I'm pretty sure that is that fan sculpt's been lifted from a piece of artwork. Uh, that look like I've just got the annual here. Actually, I, I was going to say. I think that's how it fits in the annual. Yeah, there's, there's. Oh, yeah. Where is it? The com- yeah, who, yeah. who did the complete Nemesis number three? Cliff? Is it Cliff? Someone? Oh God, I can't read the. Can't read the artist's name. Um, Clint Langley. Yeah, Clint Langley's version of it, and that yeah, he he just makes everything super organic and very very dark. Um, yes. Yeah, Clint Langley's artwork. You'd get if you just look up his artwork, you'd get a sense of yeah. what his stuff is like, and then just put Nemesis, and you see see how different Nemesis himself is, and you can sort of get a sense of precisely where everything's going. Oh, okay. Yeah. I. I yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so okay. yeah, so I, I think he did do a. He's Blitzkrieg. my least favorite artist. <laughs> yeah, I know, but but he's got he's got a really kind of Bisley esque style to the whole thing. It's very, yeah, it, that, it, that it almost looks like something time. out of Warhammer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. And I think he did do a Blitz Spear, which was very very similar. Okay. To that thing. Anyway, sir. Mm. So a three for exterior. Interior, we don't see very often. Uh, and the occasions we do, it's just a bunch of screens and a few levers and knobs and things. Yeah, no. uh, It does exist, um, but it's really not featured very often. So we're looking at a one or two on that one on the best, I think. I think a one. I've yeah. got to be honest. It's, it's always just the cockpit view looking up at Nemesis holding a joystick. There's... Yeah, or when they, they feature the ABC Warriors, literally, it's just in the background is a bunch of screens and stuff. It's, yeah. it, it's clearly just thrown together. They're not interested in it. Yeah. So, yeah. so a I'll, one, I think, I'll, is I fair. Think one. Okay. Yeah. okay For so... science, it's magic. Shit, magic. Ooh, it so is, one. Yeah, I, I was going to say one. One's even generous, to be honest. It's just that, <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy bonkers land. But mm. um, okay. So now we're on to cool factor, and here we go. Um, yeah. So, so out of four, four, I'm gonna I'm gonna give this three. It's not I say it's not my favourite strip in 2000, just because you don't get space battles or you don't have a cool character like Judge Dread. Mm. So it it's it's in one of the more interesting things about the Nemesis strip, certainly. Mm. Um, but yeah, I think three is as high as I'm going on that one. Okay, so it's three for you, Andy. Um, I, again, I've got to put the caveat that I'm basing this solely on images and. What you guys are describing to me, mm. but it, it 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 does it's not talking to me. No. Uh, so I'm going to give it one. So that's okay. four, and I'm going to give it three because I think it's a bloody cool ship. So what's that four? That's seven, nine, uh, eight, isn't it? Yep. Seven. Seven. So three plus one plus three. Yep, that's true. <laughs> I, sorry, I just naturally assumed you gave it four. So um, yes, cool. So there you go. Nemesis the Warlocks, first the first ever comic book ship and it comes in with a score of 37 which is a fine fine entry but unfortunately i don't think it actually gets us on the top 10 does it nope no i don't think only barely in the top 20 (laughs) i was gonna say it sticks it uh equal with a phoenix yeah wow okay so there you go so um it's yeah there you go. Nemesis is spaceship, uh, and that's that's thirty seven points. Well, I think that was I think that was good work there, Pete, because you didn't have a, you didn't have a lot to work with there, did you? Really? <laughs> Let's be honest. You're fairly creative. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you done quite well there, boy. You done good. So, um, right, okay. So that's the Blitz Spear, and I suppose it's on to me now, isn't it? So the Reapers, or more specifically. Sovereign, the Reaper first featured in Mass Effect 1. The reason I do Sovereign, I count Sovereign instead of just all Reapers entirely, uh, is because it's the only one that appears obviously to be carrying a crew of sorts. You, we, we can argue this. We probably will. But we probably will. Of but all of them, of all of Sovereign them. you can maybe argue has a crew. Yes. Exactly. The Sovereign, or Capital Ship, or Sovereign Class as it's known, is a two kilometre long capital ship um, and is a well known Reaper subtype. The biggest Reaper, though, is um, Harbinger, which is the first Reaper ever created, but we will never get around to doing him because he just completely doesn't qualify. Um, the uh, ship has a main weapon, which is a spinal, ma- a spinal mounted magneto 
hydrodynamic cannon with a yield of 450 kilotons of TNT per blast, which, draw, which dwarfs the main gun of an Everest-class Alliance Dreadnought. Uh, no known ship, not even the Dreadnought, has been known to survive a hit from this weapon. Um, capital ships are also armed with multiple cannons in their tendrils, capable of shearing through most opposing vessels in a single hit. And they also have a point defense, defense system, similar to the Guardian system, favoured by organic races, uh, for anti-fighter and anti-projectile purposes, and are capable of unleashing swarms of Oculus drones to engage fighter-sized craft. They're extremely durable, capable of taking continuous and simultaneous fire of four dreadnoughts before they even start to lose their kinetic barriers, aka Mass Effect version of shields. The um, the Reapers also have another thing called indoctrination, and the Reapers have a technology been observed to exert a disturbing influence on organic beings. This is the mental manipulation known as indoctrination. Put simply, any organic who is in close proximity to a Reaper, or any certain Reaper artifacts for too long, comes to believe the Reapers are correct in their goals, and will do anything and everything to serve them. Gradually, the uh, line... Again, I've had dates like this. <laughs> Yeah, it's, yeah, beer goggles, other, otherwise known as. Um, gradually, the mind is eroded until the inevitable, inevitably, uh, the individual becomes a mindless slave, no longer able to, capable of independent thought. Reapers can also control the rate of this process. Optimally, the subject is led to believe that it's acting on its own convictions. An indoctrination can drive people outright mad, and some people deemed it. And people deemed it useful by the Reapers, given them just enough free will to remain competent. In their tasks. Is, is, is this how Donald Trump operates? Yeah, actually, I think he's actually being p- controlled by a Reaper because some only something malevolent and evil would be able to basically <laughs> control someone like that and just get them to do stupid things. Um, Reapers are immensely powerful warships and their de- technology is devastating. One armament cannon of various subtypes. Oh, we've got all that stuff in there. Um, sorry, I'm 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 just think I should mention that I am reading this from um, a Mass Effect uh, wiki and a Mass Effect um, Reddit forum, which I actually went on and asked for help. Um, so I have to give props to a guy called Sakes Peregrinus and also another guy called Rocco19 on Reddit. Um, but anyway, moving on. Um, the Reaper's kinetic barrier ships can shrug off firepower of a small fleet. Weapons specifically car- uh, carried designed to overcome shields, such as Javelin or Guardian lasers or Thanix series, can eventually bypass the barriers to some degree. The difficulty is getting close enough to use them. Surface-mounted weaponry on Reaper, Reaper ships um, can pre- present an effective defense against most organic species fighters. Um... The precise targeting computers and correctors on this ship, on a Reaper ship, uh, gives it longer effective range, almost double that of um, organic dreadnoughts and cruisers. And Reapers do not appear to um, discharge static buildup from their drive cores. Uh, the Reaper power source seems to vol- violate known physical laws. Uh, Reaper, oh dear. Yeah. Reapers <laughs> usually destroy fuel infrastructure rather than attempting to capture it intact, indicating the Reapers do not require organic species energy supplies. Consequently, the Reapers attack without regard of maintaining supply lines behind them, except to move husks from one planet to another. Um, so, there you go. Uh, the Reapers carry on board them, on board themselves, um, and, uh, and a vast array of horrors. Um, which, to put it another way, would be like a Warhammer 40k type ship um, carrying hundreds of chaosy, chaotic creatures. Oh, I've I, I've played Mass Effect and I've read Warhammer, and and I'd much rather be on a Reaper ship than a Warhammer Chaos ship. Well, fair enough. Every day of the week. No, that's fair enough. I'm I can't speak from experience, but I'm just trying to yeah. illustrate for uh, Pete, who obviously has no idea. You have. Things- I, I'd say it's more akin to being on a Borg cube. Really? You'd say a Marauder or a Ravager? Oh, okay, let's put it this way. A Borg cube weather always coming for you. Yeah. There's no chance of, again, you've got no of reference for Chaos, whereas Chaos... I, I, it, it, chaos is much more your kind of Hellraiser horror. Yeah. Okay, it's, that's fair enough. In other been... words, you really don't want a, a Reaper to basically drop its cargo of crew on you. <coughs> Point of order from the uh, from yep. the dock. Yeah, Sovereign didn't have any of these. Sovereign didn't. No, Sovereign no. had Geth. 
Sovereign had lots of geth. Would you like to just show the geth to Pete? Moment. <laughs> um, so, so that everyone knows, the geth are basically a sentient species of robot um, which essentially um, rebelled against their former masters, the Quarians, and see the Reapers as gods because the Reapers are effectively humongous great robots. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing to bear in mind is that Reapers harvest human beings or harvest a species to make more of their, themselves. Um, it has been known a, a single a single Reaper can harvest up to um, 1.8 million people a day, turning them into a liquid sludge, storing them in vats to basically grow another Reaper, which is pretty damn grim. So there you go. Oh, there's a, <laughs> there's a human Reaper just in case you'd never seen one. Um, so, um, what else can I tell you about them before I move on to scoring them? Uh, where are we? I had a little bit of information about um, where, how they were designed. Um, they would initially... Uh, where are we? Sovereign, let's get to there. Where's the design? Do, 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 do. Just talk amongst yourselves. Um, the in the in According to the art of Mass Effect, um, features of... The insect anatomy were added to Sovereign's design to further tie it into Geth and synthetic species. Um, The actual uh, name of the ship comes from one who sees and observes in old Turkish because it was actually called a Nazara um, type ship. Also, the ship was um, based, or rather the Reapers were based on the idea of Lovecraftian horror. The idea of terrifying, incomprehensible alien intelligences waiting in the depths of space to feature featured in Lovecraftian horror, and this is similarly is emphasised by one of the recordings of the survey team on a derelict Reaper, which spoke of how even dead gods can dream, uh, which is a clear homage to Cthulhu, as in in this house of Riley, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. Um, I feel we ought to be wheeling Jim in at this point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, no, we really do need Jim. Light for moon signal. Exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, so basically, ancient, ancient, ancient creatures, um, which will come around every fifty thousand years and wipe a galaxy clean. Um, a the, the Reapers themselves will just do that as a part of their replication, um, and they have a great little line of "You exist because we allow it." You will die because we will it. And um, they apparently did that 50,000 years ago and 50,000 years before that. And, um, yeah, the the last thing is the only reason why we got this thing on on the jury with uh, under the door is because Sovereign is nominally piloted by um, a Spectre, a.k.a. Um, s- um, oh, what's his name? Saren. Saren, Saren, Ar- Saren Arcturus. Saren Arcturus, who basically, he sa- Spectres are like um, secret agents, space like, secret agents. Uh, I like our double or shipping. Yeah. I was going to say, it's just Blofeld. All over exactly. Yeah. So, um, Sovereign was also carrying 10,000 geth. There you go. That's the last bit. So, did you mention the Leviathan at all? No, I didn't mention the Leviathan. Leviathan is um, a race of species, a species which originally built the... The, the in-universe reason why they look like giant cuttlefish yeah. is the species which was kind a... of born the first was a giant cuttlefish. Um, and that's why they look that way. Yeah. So there you go. So, um, yes, Reapers are specifically um, sovereign. And uh, well, let's get rating this bugger because it's going to take a while, I think. <laughs> so, first off, let's go for the easy one. Let's go for size. Now, this now Sovereign isn't the biggest of Reapers, but obviously we got to count that one. Yep. And he stands 2.2 kilometres tall. I believe that's going to put you in a t- 10, is it not? One I believe so. So... There you go. Sorry, 2.2 kilometres? Yes. yes. That's 11. No, it's a 10. Oh, it is? I've got 2 to 4 kilometres is yeah, 11. Yeah, it is. It is, it's 11. Okay. Well, there you go. Woo, thank you very much for checking that, Pete. I'm going <laughs> to take all the po- points I can get in the early stages because it's all going to go horribly wrong towards the end. Um, right. So, sublight. Now, this is an interesting one. Basically, when we see them, they can travel under sort of normal power 
and they can cross they can cross solar systems in hours literally literally hours um they can tra- travel between systems well they i i suppose i count that as the ftl but basically they can travel was it you you can argue that it's they can cross the solar system in hours because when they arrive at the arcturus relay they are on earth in within hours, hours. Yeah. Uh, but that's i think all you can say on the sublight it's yeah, within hours. Yeah, no, I'm trying. I'm trying to find yeah. the other thing about the light speed because there's an because outside of the mass relays, there's actually a measurement for how fast they can travel. Um, so you might that would to... be under FTL, would it not? Yes, I know, but that, that's what I'm okay. getting to. So, um, yeah, so for traveling across the solar system in hours, I would say was that that's that's a four, that's a four, that's a four, I believe. A four yes, four, four. So there you go. Now FTL. Um, we do have the mass relays, which is kind of like a jump gate kind of thing. Um, but they do have actual ability to travel in deep space without need for for that. Um, now the problem is it, they're, they're faster than uh, they're as fast as jump gates and ee, faster than warp. They can travel. What's it? They can travel seventy thousand light years in a day. I think it is. Hold on, I'm trying. I'm desperately trying to find where it is on the bloody wiki. I, 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 again, I, I don't know if the numbers are going to change this, but I think we kind of need to stick it pretty much what we gave with Normandy because I don't think even outside of the relays, it's as fast as the relays. I think the relays are faster yeah. than it could go. And with the relays, you, you're, in, you're in effect an instantaneous jump between the two relays, but we gave the Normandy free because you are stuck solely between the two relays. You have yes. to go point to point. So I think you're probably looking at free for your FTL. I think that's fair enough. I, w- I mean, so I was. I, it was just because I had the numbers. I was kind of mm. like, I was kind of proud that I had numbers and done some. Oh, if, if 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 you want to, we'll, no, it's we'll all right. right. No, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Don't worry about it. Now maneuverability. This is a weird one. Now this is back to this whole thing of magic, magic mass effect. Ezo can make things do things when we need them to, and apparently the one thing that Reapers can do, even though the size of capital ships is turn pretty much on a dime because they reduce their own weight by using mass fields. So, they're not quite white stars, but they're certainly more manoeuvrable than Trek capital ships, so I'm going to ask for a four. Ooh. I, 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 if you'd argued for a two over a one, I might have said yes. <laughs> they're not flying bricks. There's enough. There's no, they're enough. not flying bricks. That's why I'm saying two. I mean, you see them during the uh, assault on Earth um, when uh, all, all the ships rock up and start... Um, firing off their things and and they're slowly gracefully turning and moving and doing stuff i'm uh, maybe even a free at a push because that's kind of what you see a galaxy class do at its best yeah but they're in no way getting a four because four is you know uss defiant kind of doing bloody cartwheels okay around yeah, that's fair enough. in which case in which case i would ask for a three because it is three you can have because there is enough shots of them turning literally around doing 180s given the size of a thing and the way it it moves, and, and again, I'm, I'm specifically picturing that w- when the fleet arrives and they start turning towards yeah. attacking them. Yeah, um, yeah, I think three you can have. Okay, so now we're into firepower. Now, firepower is an interesting one. We actually have an actual number. We have 450, you know, kilotons per shot, and it can take down a capital ship in a single shot. But, um, mm, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's, so obviously we're talking ten. But we're yep. also talking the fact that this thing can basically take down a capital ship and continue firing and continue shooting down pretty much everything else as it does it. Uh, so, I think you've got to have a 10, and I say that because it's got mm. the one gun, which is, for lack of a better term, it's big mag cannon, mm. which will one-shot a capital ship. But it's mm. only got one of those. Now, it does have additional defences on the end of its arms, mm. but they seem to be more like active point defence weapons. Yeah, fair um, enough. So I think you can have your 10 for your firepower. Um, and then argue active defence. Some more points there. Okay. Well, there you go. Let's move on to active defence. Now, how were we doing this? Because we were doing this one point per active defence. Per thing. We? Yeah, per one, thing. one point per thing. Okay. Well, then, in which case, what we've got is a couple of things here. And I don't know how well I can argue this, but we'll just give it a try. Just see how it goes. Yeah. Firstly, we've got manoeuvrability. Because it is... <laughs> Four or five gets you a maneuverability score. Oh, greater than three. Sorry, I've noticed that. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so we've got point defense system. That's one point. Yep. Yep. I 
could you can argue that the thing can actually turn the crew of another ship against people. Well, that would be a special, I think. Yeah, but that's actually under. It says here turns enemy weapons against themselves. Active well, defense. that was at least the intention of that one was uh, ECM. It's kind of like what ED does. It hacks into the yeah. other computer and okay, that's does fair that. enough. That's fair enough. In which case, I'll I'll just put it in special. But there you okay. go. So, so cool. one for active defense. For passive defense, it has extremely heavy shield, heavy armor. That's mm-hmm. for sure. Um, it does have kinetic shields, but they are they are super strong. I mean, they they take take literally have to get you have to get a ship on its nose firing continuously for an hour for ages you want you need an entire fleet basically pummeling one ship an, an entire fleet or one human specter well it only no, had, i'm only yeah. I'm, I'm only teasing i'm only <laughs> yeah, teasing no, 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 that's fair enough but um <laughs> but yeah so so I'm going to ask, I mean, in the same vein as, as with um, the Shadow Battle Grab, I'm going to ask for a three, because it has shields, but really it's it's kind of somewhere between sort of shit shields and really heavy armor. Uh, I, I, I hate to do this, but I, I think you're selling yourself short there. I mean, the kinetic barriers on the Reaper ship are, let, let, let's face it, until Shepard does the thing it needs to do, it holds off the entire Earth, Citadel. Uh, the, the fifth fleet, the um, the Citadel defense fleet, the Destiny Ascension. Mm. Um, it, it holds off all of those on its own sort of thing. I mean, it's not perfect by evidence that it gets destroyed, but I think you can argue a four for passive defense. Okay. I'm, I'm not going to argue that down. Yeah. You can have your four there. And, and while Pete's staying quiet, I'm just moving on. <laughs> <laughs> I know nothing. You know nothing. He has no frame of reference, Danny. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. This is this is the Blitzbeer thing all over again. Yeah. Um, right. Okay. So for special, well, we've got the indoctrination. Mm-hmm. I think we've got that. Um, we do have those fighter craft, those Oculuses. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You can have a point for the Oculus uh, support craft. Yeah. And yeah, and I, I, I think that's probably it. I can dog, so I'd argue two for special. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm happy with it. Cool, cool, cool. Right, okay. Now we get to the interesting or slightly troublesome one: crew size. Now, how are we counting this? How did we do it with the Gloriana? That's what I want to know because I think that's the one which we've got to weigh this against. Because, well, in- the vengeful spirit. Mm-hmm. Has a, now now the way I see crew is it's not how many people are on the ship, it's not how many, not how many it, it's how many people flight. are running the ship, are yeah. operating the ship. Now I think the problem you're going to have with the Reaper here is it doesn't need anyone to do it, and it's not even like a case of it can operate without um, a crew. It is actively uh, we can argue who's flying who. Is it Saren mm. flying Sovereign or is Sovereign flying Saren? Um, the Geff who are on board, I think, are solely there to be transported and used as ground troops. And that's the same with any husks and anything else on there. Yeah. Now, with the Gloriana, we didn't count space marines as part of its complement no. because they are marines. But you so, did count them as defense or attack, didn't we, you? We, we counted them uh, as one of the uh, defense. Yeah, we gave them an extra on special. So, I mean, yeah, if you want to take an extra on special for yeah. husks and things like that, that's fine. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, all right, well, you can have your free there then. But I think crew... We're being very generous in giving you a one. But let's just get this straight. It does actually need crew, doesn't it? No. In which case, it's disqualified. Well, no. It we, is... we said that crewless ships don't count. No, because no, because what happens is, this is why I had to pick Sovereign. Basically... Sovereign is the only one which it needed Saren to complete its mission. And so it does need a crew. Yes. Because... But it only needed one guy. Yes. Yes. So that's a one, then. Yes. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Because that wasn't too painful, no, was no, it? <laughs> it wasn't. It wasn't really. I mean, I was. I was expecting to kind of. I didn't because the thing was, I was trying to look through the the thing about um the what had happened with the vengeful spirit because that was the whole point was that if you look at the crew, the amount of geth and husks and everything else that's on board those ships is up in the sort of ten thousands. But well, actually, but the, the vengeful spirit, I think we said had a crew around the five thousand range, mm. but. You need that crew to operate the ship, yeah, because of the way it is. Whereas with Sovereign, it, it doesn't need. It, we see this with all the other ones. It has those Geth and uh, it has the um, 
husks and everything like that are on board. Mm. But it, it doesn't need them to operate. They're yeah. just there to... But Sovereign did need uh, Saren because yes. one of the things it needed Saren for was actually to reactivate it. Yes. So there you go. That was that. It, it, in... Look, look, Pete, Peter, I'm with you. It's a very tenuous one, but that's why I said it could be Sovereign and not Harbinger. Harbinger's it's... bigger. And it almost scrapes. One. It scrapes through on this specific particular time. Oh, it, 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 this is this is uh, legal gerrymandering at its finest. Yeah, <laughs> Absol- absolutely. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not even going to pretend that, that I'm not getting through on a massive technical loophole on that one. Yeah. But it is. <laughs> but it is the fact that in in a number of back in a number of um, codexes and in the um, one of the stories, I think it was called Mass Effect Retribution. Revelation, isn't it? Revelation, sorry. Saren Arcturus finds Sovereign dis- uh, basically run down and Sovereign basically needs Saren to complete his mission and to do the job. So it's, it sounds it's similar to, to Nemesis and the Blitz Spear, basically. Exactly. Technically, you know, Seth could fly a bit, mm. um, but he needed Nemesis in order to become the ship he actually was. Correct. That's exactly Well, I, I will it. say this just as an, a brief aside. And, and we're not going to get into this now because this would mess up everything. <laughs> yeah. But each Reaper is actually a collection of the souls that have been harvested pr- prior. What they do is when they come and wipe out a civilization, they don't necessarily just kill everyone. They kind of well, sample that's, that's... the civilizations and turn them into the new Reaper. Mm. But so, that's what I said earlier in the intro, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. But I, I, I was, all, all I'm saying, explaining to Peter is. It, the computer itself is made up of many, many, many hundreds of sentients from Thingy, but they're technically part of an AI of the ship now. So yeah, but but the point is the AI existed beforehand and could yes fly the ship beforehand. Yeah, so, yeah. Yes. Okay. It's but, making it better, but it's not. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we got crew for one. What what's this Saren skill like then? Well, Saren's skill is very good. Um, he's he, but he's the like the lead villain in the in the thing. He's a kind of a Darth Vadery type character. He's he's got a lot of power, um, and he's in a position of authority until about halfway through the game, when everyone thinks he's actually being framed by the by the main hero. So, I'm not going to say he's perfect because he is defeated by his own hubris. Well, I, I say by definition, the fact he falls under sovereign's interest well, influence yeah, kind of disqualifies that, him from being perfect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I would ask for a four, because he is a, a master strategist, and he does get one over on his own mates and shoots one in the back of the head without them knowing. He is quite... <laughs> I think you'd notice that, wouldn't you? No, but well, the thing is, what happens is he kind of he kind of pretends to be a good guy still on the good on the side of the right and then when when the other when another similar specter comes along and puts his guard down saren just shoots him in the back of the head so he is quite conniving and quite clever with it so i'm gonna ask for a four i'd be a lot happier giving you a three and that's not just being awkward for the sake of being awkward it's just i find saren as he's coming under the and again a lot of this depends on how you play the game Mm. but i do find that when i play through the game Saren as he's projected to me he, he's he's well and truly under the falls of Sovereign at this point he's well, his, his entire mission doesn't make sense because he's being indoctrinated at that point and, and yet Saren as he was in the books earlier on and he, he, he's a very I won't say evil but he's he's very focused in the mission at all costs you know he'll kill a thousand innocent people to kill one bad guy if he views that that's a worthwhile thing Saren, the spectre as he was, absolutely for, I wouldn't argue. But Saren as the pilot of Sovereign, I think you're at a free mm. because... He's compromised. He, he's, he's very compromised and he's getting more compromised the longer he is part of it. And it, again, if you play the game how I do it, when you get to the very end, he ends up shooting himself when he realises how compromised he's been. He's effectively been transformed into the first i suppose marauder if you will hmm. uh, he's no longer in control of his own f- faculties at that point he's literally a puppet on the strings by then yes so okay. i think a free is more where i'd put his competence at than okay that's fair uh, enough that i mean that also falls in line with the um the, the poor telepath stuck in the heart of the uh shadow yeah, battle exactly as well. so it's uh that's yeah. fair enough no i'll go along with that now here we go Come to the exterior, interior, and science. Here we go. 
Well, well, let's just save some time right here and now. Let's mm. give it one for science and move on from that. <laughs> yeah, let's. Yeah, one for science because that's that's it is properly away with the fairies. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, it is giant space cuttlefish. It is. Uh, it, leave that there for a moment. It, it is lit- It is literally dancing away into the field, going la 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 la. Um, as far as interior, I you, you basically get to see a chair in a darkened room. With a hat stand. With a, with hat, a hat stand. stand. <laughs> with a hat stand. So I'm not going to ask for anything more than two. Even two? Though, well, at least you see the bloody interior. I mean... And then you can have one, the same as the Blitzbeer did. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> I was trying. Um, okay. <laughs> Exterior. Now, I'm going to go... I'm going to save a lot of time on this. Uh, I'm going to go for a four. I'm not going to go for a five, because I think that Sovereign, for all of its looks wasn't the best realized of the reapers because you only see it a few times and when you see the fleet at the the reaper fleet at the end of mass effect 2 then you finally get a, si- a sense of size scale and and they they're a lot higher quality and then when you see them on earth in mass effect 3 it's like fuck those that's that's really well done and i think the fact that you progress through the games and they get better, they look better, means that really you've got to start from a. I would give, I would give like Harbinger and all that lot in, and the ones in the trailer for Mass Effect Three, I'd give them a five. By that definition, I've got to, in good conscience, give Sovereign a four. I, I, I'm very hesitant to go picking at old wounds, um, but I have to go back to our Normandy discussion. Mm. And we have to judge this off of Mass Effect 1 because Sovereign is only yeah. in Mass Effect 1. Yeah. And I, f- I feel that in 1, it's a free. I, I don't think Sov... I, I, I'm with you on in Mass Effect 3. When you see them on Earth and when you see them landing, I mean, that's such an iconic shot of the way they come down and just kind of land with that weight there and everything. Absolutely. Mm. You know, 4 or 5 in 3, I've not a problem. But in Mass Effect 1 with the technology they had at the time and the way it's realised on the screen, I'm thinking of free. See, Especially, especially mm-hmm. final mission, you're charging up the Citadel Tower mm. and it's doing the whole kind of leg pokey downy thing there. It's mm. it, it doesn't work. Mm, yeah, I mean, I could see your point. Um, the only thing I would say is it's using... <laughs> it's, for, if we're talking realization and we're using all the previous arguments of all the other book, films and everything so far, and they're all the other ships so far, it's using the same technology and the same look as the Normandy. Yeah, and I got shot down pretty bad. And you got a four. <laughs> you got shot. You didn't get for a four. You got for exterior. Uh, I, well, firstly, I was pitching for a five for the exterior first of all, and yeah. I got shot down firstly on it, it being a computer game. <laughs> And, yeah. and not being very good on that. And then the less said about the discussion about the interior, the better. But, but my that's... point is, <laughs> as you pointed out in, at that time, the later games, when they sorted it out, that's fine. If we were talking about the later games, you can have it. Mm. But we're talking about Sovereign, which only appears in the first game. Mm. You've got to take it from that one. Yeah. If no, we're talking no. about Reapers in general, if we were talking about Harbinger or the Sovereign class, mm. that would be fine. You could have a four. I'd even stretch to a five. But in Mass Effect 1, with Sovereign as we see it, I mean, I just think about yeah, that first no, time no, you see the thing launching off of Eden Prime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, I again, you know, I, I'm this this was this was my point for going for four instead of five, which was the whole thing was like, it, you do see them improve. If you think three, then I'm, I'm not going to argue that point because, frankly, by my own words, I'm saying it does get better as the games go on. So, I mean, again, if if we ever do a special on ships without crew, where mm. we can talk about those ones, I mean, I've got a picture here of Harbinger, mm. which I will send to you guys, but it's fucking awesome. I mm. mean, uh, stick this in the old... Um, mm. I, I'm sure Pete won't appreciate this because you'd never played the game up to that point, but mm. that image from the game is just one of those... Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. I think that I think the one that's over Palavan is a much better shot, actually. <laughs> the one which is kind of walking around as your oh, the one of... is just walking. Yeah, no, you're right. That's yeah. that's another fantastic shot. But... And and again, it's with you got bits with um, hmm. the, the 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 dead one where hmm. you uh, the one from Mass Effect Two where you go inside yeah. and it's been created. The interior is something out of a Super Mario Brother playbook. Yeah, uh, 
that first shot of that one against the Sun Veil was really cool. Yeah. Okay, well, there you go. I'll take the three. That's not a problem. I'll take the three. So, now, let's move on to Cool Factor. I I can't in good conscience say anything other than four, so there you go, four. <laughs> <laughs> so, someone wake up Peter. Peter! Hello? So oh, what, you're still there. What do you Work think? A cool Sp- bit. Work a cool bit. Space Cuttlefish. <sighs> what do you think? Yeah, I... It, it it looks like it's going to fuck you up badly, which presumably is the intent. Yes. It's got lots of scary eyes. It's got that whole sort of purple underside underneath it. Uh, and as we know, um, Anthony so, has, has commanded that any ship which is purple, you have to give good points to. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, yes. So I, sh- I shall give it two out of three because it, it does look not bad at all. Okay. Not my sort of thing, but still pretty, pretty evil. Okie dokie. Right. So, sorry, you're bro- you're breaking up a little bit, Pete. So, but that was two out of three, yeah. And yeah, yeah, brilliant. Okay, so that's uh, so that's six. And Andy, what are you going to give it? Pete's giving it two out of three again. If if it was Harbinger, I, I'd give it a three out of three straight away. With Sovereign, I'm going to give it a two just because. I don't think it was quite as cool and well realised. That's fair enough. As that, so I'll give it a two for. Um... So that gives us a total cool score of eight. So there you go. So, ladies yep. and gentlemen, that's that. That's it for Sovereign the Reaper, or just yeah. Well, let's just say Sovereign rather yeah. than anything else. And um, yes, he has come in with a rather mighty score of fifty-six. Ooh, that's woo. just right behind the uh, battle crab. Yeah, right behind the battle crab. So there you go. Right in the battle crab. <laughs> <laughs> Ow! <laughs> Ooh, uh, misses. The, so, the space cuttlefish has got a bad case of crabs. Yeah, oh, haven't we all? Um, right. <laughs> or, or is that just me? Um, moving on. <laughs> moving on. So uh, that's so that's in, in with a bullet at 50... Was it 56? 56. Fifty-six. Okay, so that puts it at um, eighth yep. position. Nice. There you go, in position number eight. Mm-hmm. So that's it. That's it for this week. So next week, I'm going to be bringing the fabulous green wonderfulness that is the Planet Express ship from Future Armor. Pete, and I, I shall be bringing the Heart of Gold from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Lovely. And Andy, uh, and I shall be bringing a ship from. Truly, one of the greatest sci-fi comedies of all time, uh, the HMS Bounty from Star Trek IV: The Voyage Home. No, you won't. A boo! A boo! What? <laughs> what? It's a comedy. It's bring him up. It's not a comedy. <laughs> no, it, I beg to differ. So it is. I didn't laugh. Try, try telling Anne Marie that Klingons are comedy. Yeah, that's I'm not saying the Klingons are comedy. I'm saying HMS Bounty from A Voyage Home is comedy. Anything? Oh, well, I, while I agree with you that Klingon ships are inherently humorous by looking like penises with wings stuck behind their heads, <laughs> I I can't honestly say that's not a comedy. Just because Spock it's... runs around in a bloody towel that he's nicked from a local gym doesn't mean to say that it's a comedy. I'm pretty sure there's a laugh track on it. <laughs> it has comedic elements, but A, it does not have a laugh track on it. <laughs> yes. Um, and B, it's not. It carries on straight on from Search for Spock. Are you claiming Search for Spock is a comedy? No, I'm claiming that A Voyage Home is a comedy. <laughs> well, clearly it isn't, but because no. it carries it straight is. on from Search for Spock. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's 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 the um, what's the tagging on it, Andy? Uh, I'm, I'm going to IMDb now. Hang about. Yeah. Go on in. Look things so, up. IMDb. Yeah. Star Trek Four: Voyage Home. Seven point three out of ten. That's Adventure, comedy, and sci-fi in that order. So, in so if it was a so if it was like a, an inst- uh, like a recipe on a, ba- a bottle of ragu, and it <laughs> says and it says water, stuff, and tomatoes, would you say there was a lot of tomatoes in it? Well, clearly because it's listed on top of the bloody ingredients. Yeah, but the thing is, they they do it in order of what's actually there. Well, um, does more comedy in there than sci-fi? Really. Really? Oh, it's got fucking it. time travel in it. <laughs> By your argument just now, there's more comedy in it than sci-fi because it's adventure comedy sci-fi in that order. So it's an adventure story. Brilliant. Okay, so you're hey. doing Spaceball 1. Ah, oh, you cunt. 
<laughs> <laughs> I can, <laughs> and I did. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to have a look and see what IMDb stands for fucking space. No, no, don't bother with that. That's fine. We've all agreed. I, I, I've got it here. Oh, I'm uh, sorry, you're breaking up. Sci-fi uh, I, in the same order. Blip, blip, blop. What? Sorry, I didn't quite hear that. No, so that's brilliant. I'm glad Andy's agreed that we're uh, doing Spaceball 1. So, he's yes, a good egg. Yes. He's a good egg. Good I old Andy. Andy. <laughs> So, you will stay. I will. I will rue, rue, rue the boat. That's Star, Star Trek, Trek 5. Star Trek 5. Five. Oh, God. Yeah, there was a fifth <laughs> one. There was a fifth one. I try, I try and forget. So do I. Um, yeah. that's a, now, that's a comedy right there. Best film ever. Oh, sorry, uh, the Enterprise A. Yeah, the, inter- the Fat Boy A. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's get out of here before we, we he starts singing Robo with your boat again. Again, exactly. So, um, yes, so do join us next week. F- oh, not next week, in a fortnight's time when we will be doing our comedy episode, if this one didn't count as comedy as it was. And, um, yes, we will be doing the Planet Express ship, the Heart of Gold, and Spaceball One. <laughs> and then so... Until then, do join us on our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash groups slash spacedocjury. Do watch out for us on Twitter, which is at spacedocjury, where we do spaceships of the day. And Don't forget on iTunes as well, and uh, give us a rating and review. We've had Sir Patrick Stewart himself has given us a very nice review. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that's brilliant, yeah. Yeah, it's a good view, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think old, I think old Sir Pat Stew was um, perhaps giving giving it large before then, and um, yes. So um, yeah, I think I think that's about it. So do yeah, do drop us a review on um, iTunes. That'd be much appreciated. And uh, yeah, I think that's about it, really. So. Yep. Um, listen out for our uh, minisodes, which are coming either side of this episode. Um, there's some good ones coming up. You know, I think you'll enjoy them. And um, until then, we'll see you all uh, next time. Okay, guys, all together now. Roll, roll, roll your boat gently down the stream. Roll, merrily, merrily, merrily. Life is but a dream. Merrily, 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 your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 your boat. Space Dog Jury is a production of Three Angry Beards for GeekPlanetOnline.com.